got Nadim alone on the couch. This is what I told Roger yesterday, but today's a little extra special. It's good to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, so let's just kind of dive right into it. I think almost everyone knows uh, who you are. For the sad person out there who's not quite sure what a, a Gojok is, uh, can you tell him what Gojek is and what problem it solves? Okay, I think uh, Gojek is basically an on-demand app that began with transportation and courier, but then expanded into all kinds of hyper-local shopping needs for anyone in, uh, in Indonesia, in fact. So it's basically connected to hundreds and thousands of uh, motorcycle drivers currently mm -hmm. that can pretty much do anything for you that's logistics-based or shopping-based. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I want to start off talking about the recent trip to Silicon Valley. Uh, and what fascinated me about this is I realized that back in 2011, there was a trip, a contingent of Silicon Valley folks into Jakarta. Google hadn't been set up yet, Facebook wasn't here yet, but they were checking things out and there was an entrepreneur uh, contest and Gojek was a winner there. Yes. And so this is kind of like full circle for you. Yeah. When you went over there, what was that like? What, do you, what was the highlight of, of the trip for you? Well, that, that in fact was my, only my second time to the valley. Really? Yeah. When the, was the first time? The first time was two months before that. So oh, okay, I, okay. I had never ever gone to the valley before. The award that I got received was the Gepi Award in Bali. Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of the first interaction with several VCs in Bali. So going there was kind of like, it felt like going to the, the mecca of, mm -hmm. of, of technology and, and it was incredibly inspiring. I think that the culture that they've created there of questioning things, mm -hmm. of critically thinking, and all doing this without ego. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very strange. People, people are very self-aware in the Valley, and, and I think a lot of uh, startups here are starting to adopt that mindset of just saying things how they are and never getting personal about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that's what allows the innovation to take place in yeah. a safe environment. Yeah, so that, that's the first thing that impressed me. The second thing was how clean everything was there. <laughs> really nice offices. Yeah. <laughs> so w while you're over there, from a, from a business perspective, what was some of the highlights? When we were talking with uh, Pak Thomas Limbong yesterday, he was saying that he kind of saw it as a great opportunity just for, for sharing and for learning from each other. But is there any like business focus to, to this trip at all? Well, I think the most critical part of that meeting with the, the, the big VCs uh, the leadership, the v these were like mm. the VC celebrities basically, yeah, yeah. right? So there was Sir Michael Moritz there, Yuri Milner was there, Mary mm. Meeker was there. And it was amazing that four of our ministers uh, came and attended and had mm -hmm. this discussion and brought with them uh, some of the, the, the startups yeah. uh, that were already of a certain scale and size mm -hmm. in Indonesia. It was such an endorsement by the Indonesian government about the new digital age of Indonesia. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the investors took that and, and it kind of comforted them that the government was so eager to grow the sector mm -hmm. and to personally, personally support yeah. the growth of all of these local startups, right? Um, and, and I thought that was the biggest win yeah. of the trip. Does um, that mean that we'll be seeing more investment from uh, Silicon Valley into Indonesia? Uh, obviously, you know, Sequoia with you guys is a great example, uh, and that's one of, they don't invest so much in Indonesia, right? Normally we think of Sequoia as China or India. Was there any kind of statements or forward looking, thinking about bringing more of like, you know, the KPCB, et cetera, over into, uh, into Indonesia? Well, I think it definitely woke woke them up. I think, mm -hmm. I think the, 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 the several startups have already done the, the Silicon Valley Roadshow. Yeah. And so the, the consensus there is that when they see the Indonesian numbers, they're like, they're shocked, mm -hmm. right? They're shocked at how quickly the growth rate is of transactions and orders. So when they see that, they see, oh wow, India and China in the making, right? So I firmly believe, mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think that it's beginning to become the same belief in the Valley that Indonesia is the next frontier. Uh, uh, outside of India and China, of mm -hmm. course, which is already very hyper-competitive, super growth rates, etc. But, you know, one of the most fascinating things about Indonesia is the speed by which people jump completely to mobile, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? The, the, basically, internet in Indonesia and transactions, the process is, all, is, is done in mobile, or very soon going to be all in mobile. 
So that, that kind of leapfrogging has created this huge growth effect in, yeah. in services that people use. Um, I mean, our friends in e-commerce here will see those numbers shifting to mobile rapidly. It's been happening for the past year. Um, so I think, I think that's the special part mm -hmm. about Indonesia. It, it's jumping faster even than, I would yeah. say, India uh, in, in the mobile uh, smartphone penetration. As since Indonesia is kind of a unique market, and as you were saying, like this mobile revolution is happening, is there a lot for the average Indonesian startup founder to learn from Silicon Valley aside from openness and, and humility? Uh, the reason why I ask is I was actually surprised to hear you just say that you hadn't been, because I, I know you've been educated in the States, and uh, it seems like, at least coming from uh, Japan, where I'm more familiar with that ecosystem, people love Silicon Valley. I see on my Facebook all the time, like I'm over at, you know, uh, in Apple, I'm over at Facebook. Is that a thing for, for the Indo tech scene? Look, I, th I think that the most important part of Silicon Valley is not the location. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The most important part are people that have worked there and are experienced and are in the community there that then go on and travel around the world and touch other founders and startups around the world. So all of our investors from Silicon Valley, they spend way more time in Jakarta than we do in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. They're out there every day coaching us, mentoring us. <clears throat> and, you know, I, there is some people have this mindset that, you know, Indonesia is very localized. We don't need foreign knowledge to do this. And I think that's completely the wrong mindset. These guys have so much experience in, in, in uh, rollouts all over India and China, which in many ways are comparable to, to Indonesia. I agree that the American startup scene is probably less comparable to Indonesia, but definitely India and China, you can learn so much from rollout, execution, failures mm -hmm. that I've had. And those kind of insights are what change uh, the Gojek uh, uh, management's uh, uh, perspective mm -hmm. greatly. Huge, huge decisions were made on the back of arguments mm -hmm, mm -hmm. With, with our VCs. What's an example of one? The speed by which we launched GoFood. So originally, we thought that Gojek was going to be just, you know, no, no, our, our strength is in transport and courier, and that's what we should focus on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, the, the VCs, Koya, were, were extremely uh, uh, adamant in saying, like, you can take the food market and it's completely uh, aligned with your business vision and it's, it's actually a, a, a huge business. And after about an hour of debate, I lost the debate. <laughs> I'm like, you're right, this is a great thing. Within one month, we rolled out the minimum viable product of GoFood mm -hmm. and now we're the largest food delivery service in Indonesia, maybe Southeast Asia. So let's so. talk about that a little bit because one thing that I, I was, I've been using the app a bit and you have so many products. You have, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Send, Ride, Food, Mart, Box, Clean, Glam, Massage. Is there an extra one that I, I missed there? I'm pretty sure that was everything that was on the screen. That's everything that's on the screen, but that's not the final list. Right, right, right. So more, more stuff's coming. So first question, when is new stuff coming? When is new stuff coming? When is new stuff coming? Next year. Next year? Early next year, Come yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. We still because, got because Christmas the next, season. We can because do the this. next stuff that's coming is actually bigger stuff. Bigger stuff. Yeah. How do you define bigger? So right like, now, uh-huh. I, I define bigger as like potentially game-changing for an entire sector, right? So when, when, when we talk about bigger, there's smaller stuff which are helping certain verticals. Mm -hmm. Like our entire, uh, uh, the, the, although the potential is big right now, our, our go life is still in beta. Go life is go glam, go clean. Uh, go massage. This is basically part of our women empowerment program, mm -hmm. but it only can scale with a number of people or practitioners that yeah. we can find, right? Yeah. So it's a little bit slower. But when I talk about bigger things, it's a little bit more um, wide-reaching, and the applications can 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 kind of help a lot of people at the same time. Multi-sided. I'm I'm intentionally being vague here. This is amazing. I'm intentionally vague. being vague, but um, I you can't. You basically share said we're gonna do big things for big people. It's gonna be big, man. <laughs> <laughs> and like. I believe I, can't, I really can't say more. Uh, but yeah, we, we do have a lot of services. And, and Will it still be based around the concept of transport? Or are you just going to go off the, re off the, no, the grid? No, I don't think it's on the concept of transport. I think it's actually on the concept of on-demand. Mm -hmm. I think we've realized that transportation is only one element. Transportation and logistics is only one element of what is on-demand because it comes to you. Yeah. Right. So yes, in a sense, it comes to you is kind of our theme. Mm -hmm. 
but I like to think of ourselves as, you know, Indonesia's on-demand everything. Yeah. If you want something, whatever it is, in 60 minutes, as long as it's legal, then you can get it on the Gojek app, right? So that's kind of the, the aspiration mm -hmm. uh, for on-demand everything um, that, that we want to do. And don't forget, you know, maybe not all of the services in our application will survive. There's also this process of trial and error and incubation. Mm -hmm. We very much follow what the market tells us to go. So, you know, we listen, people react, and then, and then we reevaluate. So there's a, there's a lot of playfulness in the Gojek app that is part of our culture that we just, you know, even though something's not perfect already yet, we'll throw it out there to see whether people like it. Because perfect it will never happen, mm -hmm. right? Once you get consumer feedback, that's when the iteration program happens, and then it becomes a business. It doesn't yeah. become a business when it goes live. It becomes a business six, eight months after it goes live when you've refined what actually is the user using it for. Right? So that's, that's our approach. So product. which one of your product managers right now is feeling the heat? It sounds like the product manager of food should be feeling pretty happy. Which product manager you're like, come on, man, how's this iteration going? Do we have to kill this thing? Oh. All product managers, everyone in Gojek's management is, is always under the heat. Oh, okay. So you but brought that over from Rocket? A little bit, a little bit from Rocket, but under the heat is actually something that they enjoy. Mm -hmm. So we intentionally pick people who enjoy pressure, but also enjoy autonomy. Mm -hmm. So here, here, here's the trade-off, right? You can't put a crazy target on someone's head and then micromanage them to achieve that target. What you do is you give them a crazy target, you give them a lot of funding, and then say, whatever it takes, you're the boss. You decide on how to get that target. No one will mess with you. I become your coach. I become, you know, coach, sugar daddy, and, and friend. Let's talk about the sugar daddy right? part so of it. <laughs> you become, so it's like, what do you need? Yeah. What funding do you need? How much mm -hmm. money do you need? What marketing dollars do you need? And how can you justify it? So the concept of directors in Gojek is very different because we're running eight different companies, mm -hmm. right? These companies all have all their dedicated tech teams, dedicated finance, dedicated marketing. You Everything keep them is completely separate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to. We have to do that so that they run like their own company because we can't expect different business lines to have necessarily the same culture, the same um, uh, standardization can only happen on the back end, mm -hmm. right? You cannot build independent businesses successfully without autonomy. And because the management team of each of these guys, they're, pr they're pretty much mini CEOs, right? They're actually the CEOs of Gojek. Yeah. Um, and so the directors behave like super coaches. Mm -hmm. Like we're just, we're just, okay, what do you need? What, what do you need? What's going on? Let me help you uh, problem solve this all day. All we're doing is rotating and helping uh, these uh, mini CEOs achieve their targets. So you said a couple things in there that I find really interesting. The first is this idea of having eight companies that are, are pretty separate, or eight, eight verticals that are pretty separate. I feel like that might be slightly different from what some people would say, which is if you have like a tech team, keep the tech team unified, because ultimately it's in the same app. So is it really like even down to the, the technology development itself, is it really kept separate? Well, tech is where the thread runs. Okay, so, so that team is unified. Even though they're dedicated, meaning that they're constantly running mm -hmm. each of these products, the tech is managed not by the product team. The tech is managed by our tech leadership. Yeah. So Gojek has about six C-level mm -hmm. um, uh, directors for tech, only for tech. So uh, we have a CTO and then we have five C-levels uh, mm -hmm. underneath the CTO. And what their job is, is to connect all of the back end, connect all the customer database, uh, standardize the QA process, yeah. standardize the sprint planning and deploy process so that people are not competing uh, mm -hmm. as much for resource. But a, a good dose of healthy competition between products is always good. <laughs> so, so one of the mm -hmm. things that we do in Gojek that's interesting, we don't have progress review meetings. Mm. All the data is served daily on a chart. Okay, okay. It's served to the entire management and investors. So everyone knows how everyone's doing every single day. So that's why we don't need progress review meetings. We just need, hey, what's going on here? Hey, what's this? How can we help here? So does it make that does it make it easier to raise funds? Because you're in a, from what I can understand, a pretty capital intensive uh, industry. Having new investors with that sort of transparency, does it make it easier to say? Because you were saying, like, what funds do you need? Does that mean that you can like ping an investor 
hey, you see the numbers, you see the plan, can we just get it now? Is it that easy? Oh, no, no, no. I'm talking about as management right. to, as top management to the company. Okay, it's not so like, oh, we need some more money, Mr. Investor. No, no, no. I was say, like, you just really support. cracked the, the <laughs> investment code right there. No, but I think, you know, in many ways, Gojek has been very lucky. Mm -hmm. Gojek has been very lucky for, an, for various reasons. And one of the luckiest things that has happened to Gojek is to have um, investors, um, the people of which become their, are basically our board, right? Yeah. That are so passionate about the business model that they behave to us not like, in, like what you would think an investor is. Mm -hmm. The investor itself has the same kind of relationship to us that we have to our lower management. Mm. It's almost like, what can I do to help? Yeah. Who can I send over there to help? Which, which tech expert can I send over there to help? Which, uh, what kind of uh, analysis you need to do on your price subsidies that could optimize it? This, that, that. So it, it's been an amazing ride to have investors that aren't there like, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? But we built strong relationships with our investors so that they almost behave like they're part of the top team. And that, I believe, is something that, that has made this journey so much more comfortable because the business itself, mm -hmm. every, there's so much th stuff going on, right? Yep. Stuff happening wrong, uh, tech issues and so on. So having that core relationship mm -hmm. between your team and between the investor team, it just it makes everything so much smoother and So how enjoyable. much have they given you so far? Money? Right? Yeah, well, hugs, <laughs> sure. I'm not allowed to say, actually. Why are you... So this is something that we always talk about. We want to know, like, what's the, what's the funding amount? What's the valuation? So what's your reason for, for declining? I mean, what's the point? I mean, why, why, why share that kind of information? I mean, we're not, we're not trying to, you know, impress people or trying to uh, 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 I, raise more money by saying how much we raise, you know? Mm -hmm. all, of those, all of those tactical decisions, we want to run our company the way we want to run our company. Right, so I do just don't feel that there's really a need to share our valuation or how much funding we've raised. I mean, some companies do it. I understand there's a tactical reason to do that, and that's that's their strategy. But our strategy is just like keep your head down and do the work, you know. So, if you were to share, would you say that it's starting with a seven zero 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 Zero, zero. I've lost track zero. of your zeros. 700 million, my man. Is that your valuation? <laughs> no. no, no, I can't. I really can't uh, share any of those numbers. I apologize. Uh, so one but thing chances are whatever rumors you've heard is probably not true. Rumors tend to inflate everything uh, too high. So. so 800 million. Good job. Good <laughs> job, man. Okay, okay. Uh, so part of, I think, maybe the result of not sharing, and I understand what you're saying, but it also, I think, there's certain founders or certain other investors mm. who might get dissuaded from entering a market where there's clearly like a really, really tough player. And we've seen like a ton of uh, people pop up. You'd see, from what I could find, there's something called Lady Jack, Blue Jack, uh, Bi uh, Grab Bike, of course, Ojasi, these sorts of folks. And now that you're getting into uh, the food, technically uh, a player like say a Red Mart, like Roger was here yesterday, they're also, or, or what's it, uh, Happy Fresh. Those are all now your competitors. Uh, do you think that one of their, and they all seem to be announcing their funding, do you think they are trying to intimidate you? Um, I, don't think, I don't think that's their rationale. Mm. Uh, for, I am extremely actually encouraged that other people are, are, are popping up. And, and, and also, and by the way, we're not the first in launching some of those. Some of those guys launched first mm -hmm. before us. Like, uh, so, so Happy Fresh was before Go Mart, for example, even though we already had a shopping function. It's great, man. I mean, the market's so big. The market's so big that anything that can educate the marketplace right now will just help everyone, really. It's, 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 it's something that the, the penetration point is, is not even that big yet for each of these verticals and services that I think that the more the merrier at this stage, right? Especially companies that are founded locally. Mm -hmm, companies mm -hmm. that are founded locally, I'm, I'm particularly uh, excited about um, uh, because that, that helps the entire ecosystem, right? I mean, Gojek, part of Gojek's impact is not just to the people who use Gojek and to the drivers, but I think to, to the ecosystem of startups 
uh, it's, it's, it's really, uh, we, we love the fact that we're giving more uh, spotlight mm -hmm. on, on the digital ecosystem in Indonesia. A lot of people are, when we, keep, we introduce a lot of startups to, to investors. Mm -hmm. It's like, we're always like, we're always like, uh, you know, pimping startups to yeah, our yeah. investors. Like, hey, check this out, check that out. Um, because it, it's time, man. I mean, this is gonna be the next growth spread in Indonesia in the next 20 years. It's gonna be the digital economy. I don't see anywhere else that you're gonna get, you know, 100% year on year growth on any sector in Indonesia except for tech. Right, um, and 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 we're not talking about you know back in the day it was only like raw materials investments that were in the fifty hundred million investment mm -hmm. tickets, but now tech is approaching those levels, you know, in Indonesia, uh, uh, India and China it's been doing that a lot. So just from a foreign direct investment perspective for the entire country, it's enormous. It's enormous. I think it's it's our biggest hope. And tech. also, uh, well, that's definitely I think the whole mission of this conference and. Uh, Pak Thomas was saying something very similar yesterday. Uh, what strikes me as interesting is, so you're expanding very rapidly, you want to expand even more. Uh, do you think one of the benefits of introducing all these startups to investors is that it will make it easier to acquire them later on? <laughs> no, I, I, don't, I don't think that's the rationale. Um, no, it, but it might be an extra perk. I understand that it's a good idea to support the community, but I guess my core question is, what do you think of acquisition as a means of uh, expansion or of consolidating a certain market? Like, ultimately, is it, is it okay for something like a, well, in the food business, is it okay for there to be that many competitors out there when you can maybe just control more and more of the market? Well, I think, okay, at this stage, we're not really thinking about it mm -hmm. like that. However, I do have to admit that, you know, convergence is a reality in the mm -hmm. tech space, right? You gotta expect at some point there's gonna be more and more convergence. You simply cannot have 12 large e-commerce players yeah. in one market and expect everyone to win, for example, right? If it's a standard. And, and, and I think convergence is something that will happen when the market is a bit more mature. Mm -hmm. Convergence will happen when saturation is higher. At this point, convergence probably is less attractive for the buyer or the seller mm -hmm. right now because there's so much room to grow, right? There's still so much room to grow. So unless it's to, you know, squash a potential competition, et cetera, but at this stage, competition's good. You know, I don't think anyone wants to squash competition. Just help grow the market now, yeah. So when we're talking about growing the market, uh, I guess what I want to learn a bit from you is how, how do you manage uh, these expectations. Uh, so as you're growing and growing, I understand that you did a recruiting event in a stadium, right? And it was like 16,000 people in one go. Do you, what, what are your plans for scaling up, up the, the driver force? Because as you add more and more things, I'm going, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm going to assume you're gonna need even massively more drivers. No, we're already oversupply on drivers. We've got enough drivers to last us a long time now. How many drivers do you have now? 200,000. 200,000, that's 200, a huge jump from I think the last publicly displayed number. It's, it's big, it's big, it's a bit too much. You can applaud, I, you guys are like, can we <laughs> applaud? Go, you can go for it. Yeah, we went a little uh, overboard on the hiring yeah. side, so you know, some drivers are complaining, so we stop recruitment now on the big cities, uh, and then we're, we're weeding out the bad rated drivers, mm -hmm. so that the good rated drivers get most of the orders, because that, that's who deserve it. Yeah. So we're good for recruiting. I think everyone is a little bit oversupply right now, right. even our competition is. <laughs> so um, you, it's, it's a fine balance, right, between demand and supply. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we're working on the demand side. The supply side is kind of done. So I'm actually really interested about the, the driver side because we see in a lot of these sorts of quote unquote sharing economy services that that ends up being in some ways a, a huge limiting factor. The customer like us, we love Gojek, we love Uber, we love the convenience. And then the drivers sometimes get a little grumpy or maybe their experience changes. You hear a lot about that with Uber in the States. What does Gojek do to keep the drivers happy? Well best way to keep, I mean, there's a bunch of different ways you can make them happier, mm -hmm. but the only real sustainable way of making them happy is continuously giving them orders. Mm -hmm. That is, that is the, the core basis of that trust relationship. You give orders, they remain loyal, and they treat the customers good in order to maintain the brand equity. That's well, it's also an issue cycle. of the money they get per order. Yes. And so this is what kind of fascinates me because 
uh, I, heard, I read that what, back in June at New City Summit, you said that the, the percentage that drivers get is 80%. Mm -hmm. And earlier in the service's uh, existence, it was 65. So you've raised the percentage that drivers get. Yes. But we still see reports of like drivers not being happy. Yeah, yeah. So the percentage never changes. The driver always gets 80%. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we've made a few tweaks on the price per kilometer that the driver okay. gets paid for, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that we reduced to rationalize because our orders were getting out of control. Right. Our orders were getting so high that we were, we were just uh, overly subsidizing. So we decided to do that but still maintain the promo mm -hmm. uh, to the customer so that net net more orders, drivers will end up winning again, right? right so, right. Um, but the, the, the jump from 65 to 80% was just because we wanted to recruit really fast. Yeah. We wanted them to not even think and say like, uh, and, and it's good. This 20% uh, take rate is going to be, I think, forever, right? Um, just like Uber's take rate is 20%. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, the nice number that makes it uh, uh, acceptable for the driver and the unit economics for the company as well. But how do you, it, it, the reason why I'm harping on this a little bit is that it seems like there's some folks who aren't seeing the same vision. It seems like there are some people who feel like with this uh, lower rate per kilometer, they're getting less than they were before. Mm -hmm. So to those folks, like how, how do you explain that no, it's still okay, you're still getting uh, a really, really good uh, salary, it's still like a fantastic service. Like why are they having a disconnect with you? Well, let's, first of all, I think the key word there is salary. Mm -hmm. None of these guys are employees. They are micro entrepreneurs. So do whether you, they're wait, not- Wait, 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 do you think they see themselves as micro entrepreneurs? Well, they should. Well, I, they're my definitely girlfriend says I should see myself as a person who works out every day. Doesn't mean that I am. <laughs> but they are, they work for themselves. They can decide when to take an order and when not. No one's telling them what to do. They're free to take orders whenever they want or not. I don't think that's a job. That's a, that's a you, you, are, you are there to take and work as hard as you want. The orders are out there, go hunt for them. So to be, to be quite frank, yes, of course, there's a lot of benefits like driver bonuses that mm -hmm. we give, right? We cover their, uh, uh, if they get into an accident, or et cetera, we cover everything for their accidents. Uh, we have a whole bunch of slew of services that are coming up to them involving all kinds of uh, insurance related stuff. So yes, of course, and we have awards, ceremonies, et cetera. But running a business like this, you also have to have the courage to make the hard decisions mm -hmm. that the business needs and to understand that our relationship with the driver, we're still subsidizing heavily, by the way. Yeah. So actually, we're still you know, subsidizing very heavily. But at some point, you got to make the really tough calls that's good for the business. And the drivers get it in the end. Of course, they're not happy about a, a, a rate cut drop, but they're not leaving either. Right? Everyone is free to leave. Mm -hmm. which means that the value of this kind of a model is still much better than what's out there in the market. You know, they're still above minimum wage salaries. They can work. The flexibility part of it is actually huge mm -hmm. for a lot of them, especially for the women drivers, you know, where they can actually uh, work all day while their kids are at school. As soon as their kids go back, they can, you know, uh, make them supper. And then at night when they're asleep, they can go and take a few more go food orders. So that flexibility has value in itself outside of the monetary value. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, uh, they, they are, they're micro entrepreneurs, they're not employees. It's, uh, it's hard for me personally to fully agree with that. I, I get that they set their own schedule, but if you, the, essentially, that's like the same argument you can make for a freelance person. But I think yes. most freelance people would say that uh, my job, my work is like as a designer. If I, if I don't do it, I might have freedom or whatever, but a designer is not going to take a, a gig that doesn't pay them enough. Yeah, and they shouldn't. But that's the freedom yeah. that not being an employee gives you mm -hmm. as a freelance. You can say no, whereas an employee has to do it because they get uh, a fixed salary, right? Do you think that there's going to be the same sort of issue that we see in America with this idea of contract worker versus employee? Or is like the regulatory structure in Indonesia in such a way that that's like a moot point? that would basically destroy the whole concept of flexible working model. Yeah, if, I think Uber's pretty pissed about it too. <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, and, and in the end, the drivers will not want that either um, because it will just basically restrict the amount of people that can enter, mm -hmm. right? It will sh restrict the amount of people. If we were to do a fixed cost model, we would probably have to let go of 70% of our drivers. 
And then what do those guys and their families do? So the government fully recognizes the value that Gojek brings to unemployment levels mm -hmm. in Jakarta. Actually, the statistical board did some analysis and mm -hmm. said that even in this macroeconomic climate where everyone's getting rid of it, Jakarta unemployment actually has improved a little bit. And they can't attribute it to anything else except for online Ojek business. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I think that's a, you know, the, the more, the more th you, you regulate price points and uh, salaries at the bottom of the pyramid, the more market distortions happen and less people get jobs. Mm -hmm. The last minimum wage hike in Jakarta caused a huge outflow of unemployment, of which a lot of those people actually became Gojek drivers, mm -hmm. right? Because companies had to lay, lay off. Companies had to lay off because of the huge increase in, 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 uh, in minimum wage. So there has to be these safety nets that catches people who get dumped out of the, inf uh, out of the formal economy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you know, companies like not only Gojek, but all, all these different kind of companies, even Bukalapak and Tokopedia and enabling them to sell stuff uh, from home, et cetera, it's a huge value add to, for people that have been turned away from the formal economy, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And I, I think it's very clear that a lot of people agree with you. Like, it's no stretch to say that Gojek is one of those few companies that is transforming lives, cities, countries. You're doing it with, as you were saying, you're still heavily subsidizing the rides. What happens when you can't do that anymore? Like, how, how does the, the, I'm sorry if this is like a dense question, but how does the company move forward if those subsidies stop? Well, that's a good question. It's a very good question. Um, as you probably, if, if you're a Gojek user, have you, you probably noticed that a lot of our prices are already, are already starting to increase, right? There's a lot of uh, couriers rising now, uh, outside of Jakarta is mm. rising now, and that will be a steady trend right. towards eliminating the subsidies, mm -hmm. right? So it's happening, and, and it's not like we do subsidies without knowing how big the drop is going to be when we yeah. take it out. Yeah. We do. We do sensitivity analysis all the time. Mm -hmm. So we, we're, we're fully aware of how much it is. So that's why it's all about maintaining enough cash mm -hmm. so that you can get there. Yeah. And then when you do do it, you don't completely destroy the driver <laughs> yeah, yeah, income, yeah. Right. right? So um, that's, that's, that's probably the hardest balance. Mm -hmm. But we're getting better at it, actually. Yeah. We're getting better at projections. We're getting better at calculating sensitivity, mm -hmm. pricing, et cetera. So... Um, but you will see, like, the prices of Gojek are not going to go down anymore. It's only going to go up, right? Uh, I'm sorry, the, the merry-go-round must stop at, the, at some point. But it will be a gradual transition. Right. And so we, we've planned that out financially as well. I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to, we're, we're getting near the end. And so one thing that I kind of want to highlight, we, we just discussed how you've really impacted the country. And I saw that uh, you uh, were able to make a deal with the Transportation Authority uh, for getting people to the bus station so that way the buses could be mo used more efficiently, right? And that was something which the meeting, the first meeting at least that was reported was like January or something, and then it was announced like this actual deal, what, like seven, eight months later. What other sort of projects or potential projects uh, will you be working with the, the government on to, to kind of use Gojek as something that powers not just people's convenience, but also their their way of life? Well, you know, this for me personally <clears throat> is probably one of the most exciting things about, mm. about being able to work in, in Gojek. Um, <clears throat> our app is in the hands of 6.4 million people uh, in, in, in Indonesia. There are so many things that we could do to help the government actually do all kinds of services, right? And that's, although that's probably a little bit farther away, the first thing that comes to mind and the reason why we launched Go Busway, so people can track their buses mm -hmm. and get a Gojek uh, on time for their actual bus and arrives on time, is, is actually on increasing the adoption of mass transit. You know, there's a lot of people that saying that Gojek is a competitor to mass transit and that can't be further than the truth because our price points are totally different from mass transit, okay? Um, what we want, because eventually mass transit is going to become a very, a much more adopted use, right, in mm -hmm. Jakarta. So then, go, I see OJEX in general will then become much more short haul trips to become feeders 
to take them to the busway stations because there really is no other mode that can get you from your house quickly enough to the station to take it. So it's the perfect feeder system. So the government realizes this, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that you know, OJEX, is, although they are an informal sector, they are the biggest hope for mass transit by getting people from their house and making it cost effective enough to get them there on time. Yeah. So to help this mass transit ecosystem in a powerful way and digitizing it is my personal passion. Um, you know, I can't share about the details of, of, of any deals as of yet, but I can tell you my aspiration. Mm -hmm. My aspiration is to have a single app that connects all transportation modes in, in, in Jakarta and all the other Indonesian cities, all seamless, cashless. I mean, it's, it, it would be awesome. Mm -hmm. it, it would be awesome and it would help a lot of people. Uh, it would probably be able to increase accountability of drivers, right? Also, it would probably increase the, the income of all kinds of transportation drivers, including bus drivers. Mm -hmm. And it would give, you know, the ability for consumers to give ratings to what the public services are like in real time. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's what, you know, data becomes the single focal point for improvement of any service. Yeah. It's data, real time data. So if you can do that, if you can, if you can comment or complain about anything, that's why I love that app Clue. Uh, oh, yeah. in, in, in Jakarta because it gives you the ability to complain about anything. Indonesians love to complain, <laughs> by the way. It's, it's one of our favorite pastimes. Um, so, you know, to, to, to bring that channel in real time is, is, I think, extremely powerful for the government and for private sector players. So what's a, what's a rough timeline on when the next announcement might be coming? I think you're going to hear some, some cool stuff starting January. January February. Again. I want more I know stuff that's like a year. lifetime in Gojek timeline. I know. But yeah, around January, February. I think you'll hear some some cool stuff there. So you talk about this this pretty big vision, uh, one app, one app to rule them all. Uh, what's the roadblock to making that happen? Well, there's all kinds of roadblocks. Um, I would think that, you know, maintaining the the so we just we just we went through a very rough patch of technology last week, mm -hmm. and only on Monday did we have this huge upgrade, and now the system is purring. It's, it's great. So the first time in Gojek, like, the response times are at unparalleled speeds. But as we add more and more products, as we add users to the thing, that will, it will always hit a certain point again in which we have to mm -hmm. scale up again our, yeah. our backend system. So I think, I think the biggest challenge is that, because we can't control growth. People just decide to download and use our product, right? So we can't control that part. Um, so we have to always play catch up. And I think that's where other transportation app companies had like the luxury of two, three years to yeah. get it stable. Our growth rate got to where they are. And so we only had like six months yeah. to do what they got to do in two years. It's a bit unfair, but that's how it is, right? We have to deal with the, the fact that suddenly we have a 6.3 million app base. So well, is it three six? 6.3 million downloads. Downloads. downloads, downloads. What, what about the MAU? Active, active yeah. rate, we can't share that. Can't share. But it's high. <laughs> it's higher than <laughs> probably the numbers that you hear from, from website-based companies, et cetera. It's obviously not as high as WhatsApp, but WhatsApp is not a Wait. transactional platform, right? So um, from a transactional platform, it's the highest in Indonesia, from for sure. Anything that you buy. Something. I'm trying to figure out how to verify this. From a transactional perspective, is it, high, is it uh, what, higher than 50%, 60 I can't share you that number. Can't I really share? can't. Uh, it's a Just very a sensitive bit. number. Yeah. How much do you guys want to hear this? It's high. It's high. It's high. Okay. Just, <laughs> this is on you guys. You had a chance to cheer and yell out, <laughs> we want to hear it. That was like, yeah, it'd be okay. <laughs> okay. You're off the hook. You're off the hook. <laughs> Get my back next time, guys. Come on. So, um, just to kind of wrap things up, you talk about the, the, the grand vision for, for the future, and I guess what is the, in order to stay focused, there's so many things you're working on, you have eight different companies, just like as an entrepreneur, as a founder, and as a, a basically a group level CEO, what is your most important method for staying focused and executing? my most important method for staying focused. I think sticking true 
to why people use us in the first place, mm -hmm. right? Instead of trying to do everything that we can do, the philosophy is not to do everything that we can do. The philosophy is to try everything and then do what we do best. Okay, so iterate, kill, fast, refocus. And the only way to do that is by creating autonomous units, like I said before, literally different organizations with an entity. So their job is to focus, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? And how I see me and my top teams, uh, the directors of Gojek's job, is to set direction, right? And, and also make the tough calls that sometimes the head of a product can do. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, what do we do? Do we, you know, uh, increase price or do we uh, uh, improve tech, right? Sometimes you get trade-offs like that that has to be decided by us. Mm -hmm. But I think the method, the method of, of what, what keeps me focused the most is, is actually using my product a lot. I've heard you're a power user. I am a super power user. I'm up there in the top 10 users of Gojek. So I'm uh, about five, six times a day. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, but I think getting really close to the drivers and every time talking to them, using the product over and over again, we become customer obsessed. And if you hold that, that, that we borrowed from Amazon, mm -hmm. customer obsession as a, as a value. Um, and there's only one other value that's probably more important than that in Gojek, and that is be fearless. Mm. That's our number one principle. And what it does, being fearless does a lot more than it allows you to take risks. Being fearless also makes everything, every single challenge or obstacle that may happen as simply just that. It's just an obstacle. It doesn't matter. It'll come, it'll hit, we'll get through it, but I'm going there no matter what, right? And that kind of uh, level of clarity and like you said focus to mm -hmm. achieve where we want to go mm -hmm. is something that is is the that's the untangible value of Gojek's management that's why we're kind of missionaries instead of employees because we firmly believe that no matter what tries to stop us in our tracks we'll get there no matter what because we're helping a lot of people out mm -hmm. if we're if you're helping a lot of people out you know the world will show a way to get there and that has worked really elegantly for us in all kinds of challenges we face. The last word from Nadim. Give a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.